Hello and welcome to episode 74 of Do More With Your Money. I am your host, TJ Van Gerben. On today's episode, we're going to talk about Biden's new American Families Plan tax proposal and some of the major takeaways from what I'm seeing, some things to consider for planning decisions, and ultimately like what you should be taking away as well. Before I get into it, I do want to give credit to Michael Kitsis and Jeff Levine, just because um, you know that, that really is where I get most of my information for this kind of stuff on Kitsis.com and um, Jeff on Twitter as well. They're super insightful and, and very giving as far as the information that they provide. So that's the source as far as what I'll be talking about today for the major takeaways here. If you want to Look at it yourself. Uh, again, kitsis.com slash blog, and uh, it should be up there. It's from September 15th, a- analyzing Biden's new American Families Plan tax proposal. So let's get into it. So what are some of the major proposals within the tax plan? Well, the first takeaway is that uh, it would increase the top marginal tax rate from 37% to 39.6%. Um, so, uh, you know, a 2.6% percentage, that's four. Uh, individuals making over 400,000, uh, 450,000 for married filing jointly. So a little bit of a bump on the top end, and that's back to where it was prior to Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So nothing too crazy there. I mean, if you are in that income tax bracket, there's definitely going to be other stuff uh, impacting you within this proposal. But, um, you know, as far as the other brackets are concerned, it looks like they did um, kind of increase the brackets for over that 400k figure, so you're going to be pushed into a new bracket quicker. Beneath the 400k uh, zone, there's not too much of an increase. It looks like once you get over 400k, now you're going to get pushed into the 35% tax bracket. Um, as an individual, whereas before you could go up to 523,000 um, before you would get hit um, with a new tax bracket. So it, they decrease the band there to hit that new tax bracket. But again, if you're below 400,000, um, there's no changes to the marginal tax brackets for this um, proposed tax plan. But one of the big things on the capital gain side, so that was for income tax. For capital gains, there would be an increase on the top capital gains rate from 20 to 25%. So, you know, originally they did propose um, kind of getting rid of the difference between capital gains tax rates and earned income tax rates. So taxing them the same. So they had talked about, you know, making a 39.6% rate if you're in that income range. Um, but they, they've changed that to 25%. However, it kicks in at a lower income level. So you would hit that 25% capital gain rate for long-term capital gains above 400K, um, which is different, which it was previously a million. Um, so you're going to get hit with that 25% um, much earlier. And then the big thing here with the capital gains tax rate is that it would be effective September 13th of 2021. Um, So that's a little out there for me, just the fact that, you know, we're still talking about this proposal and it would be effective for this year or, or after September 13th. So that definitely could impact some planning decisions. Hopefully you've already, um, you know, (laughs) made decisions earlier this year, uh, but again, it always goes back to financial plan. I don't. I wouldn't make decisions based on tax rates solely, but definitely something to be aware of. The fact that it would be kind of um, retroactive like that. So yeah, basically for the capital gains tax rates, um, you would be zero percent, zero to forty thousand um, for individuals, zero to eighty thousand for married filing jointly. Forty to four hundred and forty-five thousand was the current range for um the 15 percent now it's 40 to 400k so i guess a 45,000 difference there for that capital gains and then above 445,000 was when you hit 20 percent um now if you're above 400k you'd be at 25 percent for uh, single if you're above 450,000 for married filing jointly 
that's when you'd hit the 25% capital gain. And again, these numbers, the 450 and 400,000, that's for income. So if your income is above that, but then you also have capital gains, you'd be taxed 25% long-term capital gains. Again, long-term capital gains, you have to hold for one year. Short-term capital gains, you'd be taxed at your earned income rate. So definitely something there to be aware of. Um, the next thing is business profits from S corporations will be subject to a 3.8% surtax for taxpayers with more than 400K. So again, this 400K figure seems to be a, a sticking point for kind of increases in tax rates. Uh, obviously, S corps, you know, that only applies if you have a business and have structured your business as an S corp. I'm not going to really get into that too much because that's a little bit out of the scope of who I tend to work with. Um, but it is something to be aware of. if you don't, if you have an S corp, then there could be a surtax of 3.8 above 400k of income. There would be an additional 3% surtax on all modified adjusted gross income above 5 million. Um, again, probably not gonna impact too many people that <laughs> we need to be worrying about. But you know, it's it's definitely something to be aware of. Um, here's a huge one is Roth conversions. So prohibits all Roth conversions for taxpayers in the highest, so the 39.6 ordinary income tax bracket starting 1-1-2032. So if you're in the highest tax bracket, you won't be able to do Roth conversions starting in 2032. Um, not sure really why that would be a problem. I mean, would you really want to be converting money at the highest bracket? Not sure. Now, this is the really the bigger one that impacts kind of the day-to-day -day people, especially folks who I work with, is Roth conversion on after-tax funds in retirement accounts would be prohibited for all taxpayers starting January 1st of 2022. So this would eliminate backdoor Roth as a planning strategy. So if you're doing a backdoor Roth IRA, or if you have availability of after-tax contributions in your 401k, and we're doing a mega backdoor Roth, that's going to be shut off as an option. So that's definitely a bummer for those who were taking advantage of those strategies because it was a way to shift money into a tax-free account. Now I see why they're doing it because long-term that could definitely cause issues where people have a lot of you know tax-free money. Um, I had a podcast episode about this previously called uh, Peter Thiel, Lord of the Roths, and about his situation with how he um, put shares of PayPal into his Roth IRA and turned like something like it was like a couple thousand dollars into seven billion dollars and that's all tax-free money so i think this a lot of these proposals there's one about uh prohibited transactions within an ira later on here about how you can't put certain types of investment in there as far as if you have material involvement and that's definitely going straight at peter Thiel because of how he abused that um kind of loophole at the time and and now has literally billions of tax-free dollars in his Roth IRA. Um, so retirement plans prohibits traditional and Roth IRA contributions if your taxable income is above 400K. So that that's actually substantial too. So, you know, if you have 400K single, 450 married filing joint, um, then you actually can't make Roth or traditional IRA contributions. Uh, the limitation does not apply to contributions to employer plans. So you'll still be able to contribute to your 401k, but not an IRA, which ah, I just, I don't get it that really. I mean, I don't really see the downside of that. It's an extra $6,000 for an IRA. So yeah, I mean, something to be aware of there. You won't be able to do IRA in addition to your 401k if you make over 400k as an individual 450 married filing jointly. Uh, retirement plans. So imposes required minimum distributions on large retirement account balances. If your income is above the 400K, um, you must distribute a certain amount of your um, retirement account. We already had required minimum distributions. This is increasing how much they want you to distribute, especially if you have a certain balance over 10 to 20 million, which is unlikely for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, RMDs, again, that's only for somebody who's over age 70 and a half. So probably doesn't apply to too much of my audience here, um, but it's something to be aware of. So yeah, here's the one that targets Peter Thiel, retirement plans, prohibits IRAs from investing in entities in which the owner has a substantial interest. So 50% is the ownership threshold for public companies, 10% for privately held. So if you have a greater than 10% um, ownership in a privately held company, you cannot own that in an IRA. 
So that makes sense to me <laughs> because this is aiming right at Peter Thiel, right? He had definitely greater than a 10% ownership in a privately held company, stuck it in the IRA, Roth IRA, and then, you know, obviously amazing, amazing windfall there uh, for what that company turned into and now what's in that Roth IRA. So not a surprise there. And, and honestly, I kind of get that one. That one makes sense to me. The next one that seems of importance is new wash sale rules. So additional asset types would be subject to the, the wash sale rule beginning in 2022. If you're not familiar, the wash sale rule, if you, within stocks, for example, if you sell a stock and then you buy it back to harvest the loss and then buy it back immediately, that loss is disallowed. You're not allowed to do that. You have to wait 30 days before buying that same security um, to, in order to actually use that loss. So it kind of prevents people from selling immediately, taking a loss, buying right back in. Now, there is tax loss harvesting strategies within there, but you can't be using identical securities. Now, right now, cryptocurrencies and other digital assets were not subject to the wash sale rule. So you could sell immediately, take a loss, buy back in immediately, and you're back in your position. Moving forward, this would also make the wash sale rule apply to cryptocurrencies and other digital assets. So that, and the other thing to consider is that purchases by additional persons slash entities can trigger the wash sale rule. So if you're, say you sell a cryptocurrency or a stock and then your spouse or dependent buys it back before that 30 days, it's still, you're still violating the wash sale rule. So it's not just about your actions, it's also about your dependents, um, whether that's a spouse or child, as well as controlled entity or controlled tax favorite accounts. So you can't do it in one account and then buy it back in a different account, that would also trigger wash sale rule. Uh, estate planning reduces the estate tax exemption by 50% starting January 1st, uh, reverts exemption to pre-tax cuts and jobs act levels. So. Again, that doesn't really bother me. Um, estate tax, I feel like, is probably one of the better mechanisms we have for redistrib redistribution of wealth. I'm not necessarily a fan of increasing income taxes, but um, estate tax that can make sense. So right now, so right now it's 11.7 million um, per person. It would reduce that to half, so 5.85 per person. Um, so you know, if you are in that you know, net worth range, again, probably not too applicable to this audience, especially if it's um, not an older audience. So wouldn't be worried too much about that. Uh, the next one is the proposal would extend the increased child tax credit and monthly advance payment. So monthly advance payments of $250 per qualifying child age six to 17 uh, $300 per child age zero to five through 2025. So credit is fully and permanently refundable. So basically that would extend that tax credit that's in place if you meet the income thresholds for that. Um, also for child and dependent care credit makes permanent the American Rescues Plan Act increases to the child and dependent care credit. So qualifying expenses up to 8,000 for one qualifying individual. So again, that credit would uh, be extended. What are some major things that are not in the bill? So number one, um, they didn't align the top capital gains rate with ordinary income rates. Again, the top one's 25% as we discussed versus 39.6. So there's still a difference there between, you know, trying to achieve long-term capital gains as a high income earner. Um, there was no elimination of step up in basis. So that means if you, when you pass away, you get a step up in the cost basis. So if you own a, a piece of real estate, that would get stepped up to the current fair market value on, on the date of your death. So then you're the person you're leaving that property to, or if you're leaving a stock, whatever, they get it with a new higher cost basis. So there was no elimination of the step up in basis. Um, no increases in social security funding, no updates to state and local tax, itemized deductions, and no wealth tax. So overall, Definitely some substantial changes. I mean, the biggest things that I would look at from a financial planning perspective, you know, on the day-to-day -day strategies I utilize with clients is the impacts to the backdoor Roth is definitely huge in my opinion because, you know, that eliminates 
the ability to move a lot of money into an into a Roth 401k or Roth IRA. So you're going to have less opportunities to build tax diversification in your investment accounts, which is kind of a bummer. Um, also, like Roth conversions, this would be the time, you know, if you are considering moving pre-tax money to a Roth account is by the end of the year, looking at where you're at in the income tax bracket, making sure you have enough cash on hand to do so. But it could make sense to convert some money there just to get a little bit more tax diversification because this is literally going to be your, if this goes through for now, going to be your only opportunity to do so. So there's a lot that goes into it. You definitely want to consult your tax professionals and make sure you have the tax on hand to pay any conversion and that you're comfortable with your the bracket you're paying the, um, the tax liability on just because, again, you don't want to, if you're in the highest bracket, then it may not make sense to do a Roth conversion. Um, you know, not being able to contribute to an IRA as a high income earner, it's not the end of the world. It's kind of a bummer. That's, I guess, something to look out for. Um, and then the other big takeaway is just the increase in capital gains, you know, an extra 5% um, once you're over that 400K income threshold. Again, not the end of the world, but um, definitely kind of continues to disincentivize selling. Um, unless you really need to, because now you're going to be a 25% long-term capital gain plus whatever your state tax rate is. So, um, you know, overall, I think it's not egregious, the tax plan, but there definitely um, are some major trade-offs there. And again, not going to get into the politics of fiscal policy, but um, we need ways to raise revenue. And, um you know, at the end of the day, we'll, we'll do the best we can with our resources to be as tax efficient as possible. So that's all I have for you today. As always, if you want to learn more about myself, head to modernwealthbuilders.com. And if you haven't already, join my weekly tips, um, join the MWB community email list. In the show notes, I will link to sign up. Each week, I provide three tips in the areas of financial independence, equity compensation, and uh tax optimization, as well as my favorite tweet, my favorite meme of the week, and uh, some other good stuff. So hope you have a great, great rest of your week. Lastly, I want to remind you to do you. Because in a world of increased commoditization, nobody can replicate you. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. None of the information provided in this podcast is intended as investment, tax, accounting, or legal advice.